started. Okay, uh, welcome to the June safety meeting. Okay, March Arrow Club safety meeting. For those of you who don't have a clue what's going on, uh, yeah, I'll try to get that focused if you can. I don't. I guess it's not that. Focus in the problem. Yeah. Well. It's, a, it's got a shadow. Yeah. Well, we'll try it, and if this thing isn't fixed by next meeting, we'll be sitting over there. Um, if you were smart, we would have gone over there first. Well, I know, but I. Yeah, we had time to do it, I suppose, but. Uh, the problem is you can't move all this. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's go ahead and get started. And uh, we'll... Uh, first thing we do is I first introduce myself. I'm not a new person, but uh, I'm Roger Mann. Uh, I am the safety officer for the Aero Club. Bob Pierce is the manager. And we got our instructors scattered out all over the audience out there and if they see anybody falling asleep they're uh, been told to hit them back of the head okay yeah, yeah well the instructors I'll throw something at them uh, so okay uh, the first thing of order in the meeting is uh, new people people who are brand new I know one guy in here for sure <laughs> it happens to be our cameraman uh, he's already shooting the meeting and, uh, but anyhow, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, I'm Ron Wickham. I was, I was actually here for the last meeting too, but I just joined the club last week, never flown. So excited to excited to be here. Yeah. Uh, the guy normally does the videotaping uh, had him join the club so that he could do this. So, <laughs> yeah, and I guess he's in uh, Korea. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, okay, anybody else that has not been to the meeting before or has not ever been introduced, uh, has she been introduced? To? This is Amanda Bain. Uh oh, sorry. Uh oh, whoa, uh oh. <laughs> hey, be at your best behavior, okay? All right, we don't want to give her a wrong idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we've had a few people here who haven't been here for a while that decided to come back. I guess it's because it's summertime. But uh, uh, Jay Molino back here is our newest instructor. However, he is not the newest member. He's been a member of the club since what, 1945 or something like that? Yeah, it's been a while. He's been he's been. A, He's one of those guys where we just, just sit there and happily collect the dues from him and as long as he, you know, but he didn't fly. Well, making money so you guys can stay yeah, I know. You were making lots of money, too, too. Uh, he flies DC-10s for Omni, right? Yeah. And he also has, and I, I don't know if you mind me mentioning it, has a, has a Satabra that he will gladly teach you how to fly and how to do acrobats in the thing yeah, over in Redlands Airport. So see him if you're interested in getting tail dragger time and some acrobats there. Okay, anybody else that's new? Art's not, so okay. All right, new pilot ratings. Does anybody here has gotten any kind of pilot? It doesn't have to be here at the club. It can be anywhere in the world. That includes even the people who fly commercial airlines, uh, Air Force, Oh come up! What is this? Is I can't believe is every. I can't believe everybody's. Nobody's been doing anything. Okay, young blood. I got my my first hour of glider time in and two hours in the T6 Texan. Oh, uh, yeah. Tell them how easy that was to fly. <laughs> As you quit on the T6, that was a glider time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, you can tell us about it sometime. Actually, he's been telling us about it all afternoon, but <laughs> and showing pictures of a big old smile. 
Uh, he's also trying to get checked out in DC three eventually, maybe. Yeah. Hope so. Yeah. Fred's gone to DC three school before. Okay. Uh, so anybody else has done anything? Nobody's got their license taken away or anything like that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Experiences. Now this is where you get to tell your story. Uh, this could be you, Robert, but anybody that has something to tell that might be an interest of the Aero Club. And like I said, it doesn't have to be uh, Aero Club airplanes. Matter of fact, if it involves an accident, I'd rather not hear it at all, but unless it was somebody else's airplane. Uh, Jump up there, Robert. Go on, I want to hear about it. Yeah, <laughs> tell us about the T6. There's nothing to tell, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to get the smile off my face. That was two weeks ago. So where were you at? I uh, flew it out of Fullerton over to Chino and then Chino back to Fullerton. So Who's that? Uh, 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 Daniel Wittring. He just moved up. He's now flying the F2. So. Wayne's uh, fame? I think it's I think it's one from Yanks. I'm not sure. But I know he's he's in the F2 now. So we we'll go over in the text and then he jumps in the, the F2. Huh. Must be nice to have money. Of course. No, that, I thought all pilots were broke because that's kind of what Well, I mean. actually, what you were telling me he is broke, so yeah, <laughs> just <we're> barely. Right. <laughs> all right, George, tell us another story. George, George is the manager of the Fallbrook Airport, so he oftentimes has stories to tell. French Valley, some guy uh, blew a tire on a service on takeoff last week. Yeah. And uh, I was trying to land there, and I. I figured I shouldn't be trying to land and get out of the area because it sat there a long time before anybody got off the runway. Huh. So that's what it was that's what then. It was a blown tire. Some guy had said it stalled, but it was a blown tire. Ah, uh, okay. Because I remember you telling us about that, yeah. but, you know, we didn't know why. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So what do you... Do? Airport, Ramona, a blown tire is off runway in five minutes. Yeah. You burn them, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just bring out the bulldozer. That's what. <laughs> yeah, that's what they try to tell us with the Aero Club planes if we ever block runway three two. And Bob said no, and I and of course they looked at Bob and Bob just looked back at them and they says, well, okay, we gotta have a plan here. So <laughs> actually, we kind of have one. Okay, anybody else? Nothing. Okay, next. Okay, uh, later on a little bit, just a few minutes, we'll go into Know Your SOPs. Tonight we're going to tell you about an addition that we put right, in the SO one, SOPs. A couple weeks ago, I was coming in on the left base to 3-2, three, three or 3-0, you know. 3-2 yeah. was the only one that was open to 3-2. The tower told me, you know, go ahead and do a 360 for take, you know, traffic departing. So I do a 360, and what, what, he's got me doing a 360 on the departure end of 3-2. It's going... C-17's down there watching me go around in circles and I'm going to the tower. It's like we move a little bit farther east for this uh, 360. And the guy on the ground saying, yeah, you know, I, he's right on the departure end. I can't take off with him there. Uh, so finally he realized I was on the departure end doing 360s out here. <laughs> <laughs> well, so don't always pay attention to what the tower has to say. You know, he could have he flown right up in the middle of your, you know, going around the circle yeah, right up yeah, to the he, middle. If it's quick, he could go around there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's good. 360, get the hell out of here, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Aero Club manager will talk to him, or he'll talk to us, rather, and then we'll talk about, well, it's, yeah, we'll kind of talk about night flying. It is now a safety gram that's out for this month. We have been mandated <laughs> to talk about this, okay? We'll talk about it in a minute. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about summer flying, and then that's it. Okay, Aero Club manager. You're going to leave after I get done. Well, yeah, well, yeah. Don't be too long. Jeez, I don't know. Uh, I've got a lot of, a lot of items, yeah, and I really somewhere. hate to bug you with it, but uh, we're having issues with people who are entering the log, the Hobbs meter for their time on the uh, pay sheet. You gotta round up. We don't round down. So round up, 
so that we don't have to take and uh, do it. If it starts to move, you've got to round up. It's always been the policy, and it's going to go in the SOPs. Uh, credit card slips. You've got to hold the slip in the machine when you start to use the roller. We've got one slip now. We're waiting for the person to come back in and redo it. But the credit card went across where you sign, put your signature on it. We can't accept it, and then he forgot to sign it. So help us out there. Um, if there's a problem with the aircraft, tell somebody. That's what we always say. Come back and see Roger. Come back and see me. If we're out of the office, leave a message so that we can come back and ensure that the aircraft can be either fixed or whatever the problem is. Whether you got low tires, you're out of oil, out of the locker. Uh, we've got people that are using the 115 because there's no oil in this, grab 115. Uh, how many people know what the 115 uh, or the 1550 is used for? What aircraft is it supposed to go into? Yeah, AMG. It goes into 182. It doesn't go into any other airplane. So when you're paying $78 a case for it, it's kind of expensive and you just waste the oil. And uh, under our present situation, we can't afford that. If you don't use the aircraft, be sure and put the cover on it. Sometimes uh, the aircraft will be left there from the previous uh, uh, student or flyer because he knows that on the schedule there's somebody else there. And then you come in and you may find something there or you may find that you're not going to fly. Um, it's going to be your responsibility to put the cover back over the windscreen to uh, keep, it, uh, keep it clean and protect it. You can always come in the office. We'll be happy to go out there and give you a hand on that. Uh, T-41 drivers. you got to clean the windshields, clean the leading edges. Since we're in the bug district now, during the summer months here, we got bugs all over. And help us out by wiping some of the bellies down. That's what we have the, uh, the sprayer for. It's got uh, pledge in it and water mix. I'm not saying you've got to take and use everything and spend two hours on it like uh, Ken Benner used to do and use goop and then wipe everything down. But we do have a couple oil leaks. We're trying to solve those leaks uh, around the alternator system. So until they can get into the hangar and uh, be pulled off and then resealed, you're going to end up with oil on the belly and oil on the landing gear. If you need rags, come and see Roger and I. There's always rags. That are sitting, they've been sitting on the floor now for almost three weeks. So there's rags that are sitting by the tote boards. Uh, grab it and clean the airplanes. Help us out. Everyone is part of the club, and it's uh, your responsibility to keep it going just as, as it is for us. Um, we covered the oil, 15 Foxtrot. Uh, I have a real issue here. We're trying to keep data on the engines to find out if we have a maintenance problem or not having maintenance problems. But if someone could tell me how an aircraft can fly for 15 hours on one quart of oil, it's beyond me. Uh, it's totally impossible. It's not like your automobile. The way these are designed and the way the chokes are in the, in the cylinders, they're going to pump oil. So if you put a quart of oil in, it goes on into the computer system, which is that it should be on your invoice showing a quart of oil was used or when you checked in the aircraft, I should have a database in there saying that you've used a quart of oil. 15 hours without a quart of oil, something else. 29 Foxtrot went uh, almost eight hours without adding a quart of oil. Airplanes don't operate that way. Um, I think David G. talked to you last month on glare shields. Keep everything off the glare shield. The, the uh, new, can't, new uh, windscreens that we've put on are all becoming scratched, including the 182. That's a $300 windshield at our cost. And when you start putting your stuff up there and then it slides down and it starts scratching, there's no way we can take those scratches out. If you're a, uh, an individual that sits fairly tall in the seat, that's going to become a distraction to you. So think about your fellow pilots and keep this stuff off. There's plenty of room between the two seats to put something on the floor instead of putting it on a glare, uh, the glare shield. So help us out in that regards. And that's all I got. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bob. Okay. Um, knowing your SOPs. Okay, Bob just mentioned it just now. Uh, 
down at the bottom of the paragraph there, it says all times will be rounded up to the next whole number. That's the new addition. It's in uh, chapter 1, and paragraph 621, uh, measurements and charging for flight time. So that uh, also includes the gas pump out there too, so that if the numbers are moving and you're just starting to move up to the next number, then you round up for it. For most of you, it doesn't, you know, you're, you're not paying for it out of your own pocket unless you have your own airplane like David G. does, who goes over there and buys it. Now, he really gets picky about if it's rounding up or rounding down because he pays that extra for you. The rest of you, the gas, you know, that's part of your payment for the airplane. But uh, try to be, you know, fair because if somebody like David G. comes up with his airplane and somebody rounded down, instead of up, you know, he has to pay for your part of the gas that you didn't do it right. So try to be courteous with that. Any questions on this? Okay. Okay. Uh, how many of you here have uh, read the safetygram for June so far? I know that you guys, all you guys that's flown should have. Um, we were sent a safety gram, and on the safety gram, it was about a scenario that took place with an aero club. And of course, he does not identify the aero club uh, for obvious reasons. He doesn't want anybody to start, you know, going, hey, hey guess what they did, you know. But um, in his, this is, this, these statements right here are from Eric Treland, who is the head of all aero clubs in the whole world. He's the guy that's in charge of them at uh, San Antonio, Texas, and um, he sent this thing out, this, this safety gram out on this incident that took place. And what we'll do is run over it real quick. Um, the attached flight safety lesson, which was there's an attachment to this, and, and it, on the, um, on the uh, safety gram, when you go on the computer, There'll be this statement on there, and then there'll be the st the the incident and and what happened and all that kind of stuff. And it's just the stuff we're running over right now. Uh, technically speaking, you can all say that you've seen the safety gram for this month after this, uh, but you still have to sign it off on the computer. Um, the attach uh, safety lessons learned uh, detail in the Aero Club aircraft that experienced an electrical system failure in the local pattern at night. The pilot used his superior skills to get the plane down, uh, but he didn't use too much, uh, his judgment was just a little impaired. Um, they taxied across a runway uh, with an active tower, and it was an active runway, and apparently there was planes flying too. Um, so, getting into what happened. Okay, the problem communicating with ADC in the dark without a radio. Okay. The scenario is, is that the pilot was coming in for a landing, and on downwind he discovered that you know his everything, his lights and everything started getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and the next thing you know he lost electrical power. Well, that means of course no radio contact or anything like that. So he went in and uh, with no electrical power or lights, no means of communicating, the pilot cleared for for other traffic and made a safe landing. So everything worked out okay. Once safely on the runway, habit patterns took over and the pilot exited to the left. Okay, he gets into a little bit later as to what's going on here. He went to the left because that's his familiar sound surroundings are, that's where the aero club was. The aero club was to the left. So he went and taxied to the left. The aero club was about a mile away. Okay, well, while he's doing that, he was kind of concerned about not being seen by any of the aircraft because he didn't have any lights. So he kind of maneuvered around and he ended up crossing over the active runway, right over, the, right over it. Um, so obviously, uh, he, by crossing that runway, that kind of got him in big trouble. Also, the Aero Club, too. All right, now, the options that he could have had is find another means of tower communications. How many here fly with their cell phones? I mean, I do. 
I, I almost know everybody has their cell phone with them. One of the things that he could have done is use his cell phone to call the tower. Just get off the runway, stop, and don't do anything. Jay. But the towers are restricted numbers. You beat me to it, that's exactly what I'm yeah, call well, the tower if their number is restricted. Yeah, but it, well, it was an Air Force base, so I mean, he could have. There's no restrictions. So, okay, then what's the numbers we have up here? We've got it, and and that one, we've got the number because yeah. the guys came down and gave it to us. But they're restricted numbers. You call a base operator, you hook me to the control tower. Yeah, it's all we restricted. Call no, yeah. I'm, I, I understand well, yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, but what could the guy have done? How would he? Without the well, he can't he, use lights to tell him he wants to cross. Well, no, but that is one of the things. Well, well this is what goes into it. Let, let's finish before we start discussing yeah, yeah. it, okay? Okay. Yeah. Uh, he also could have had a portable transceiver, which he didn't have. Well, actually, I think he did have it, but it, uh, it, was not, it wasn't either working or something like that. Uh, the way the tower could keep other traffic away from follow me, uh, he could have sent a follow me truck out or something like that. Okay, a cell phone was available in this instance, but was not thought of as operational too. Uh, carry a flashlight at night, okay? He had a little flashlight, but there wasn't really, you know, much that he could do with that little flashlight. Um, in this case, uh, the red lens flashlight couldn't be seen from the tower. Okay, let me move on. Uh, if you do not have a cell phone, flashlight, or any means of communicating with the tower, be patient and wait for further tower instructions via light gun signals. Okay, I, I wish we had what's, um, yeah, the, the guy that's in charge of the tower is in our aero club too. Murphy. Uh, Murphy. Uh, if no light signals are given, they are still searching for your location and the airport operation will be looking for you. Now, of course, obviously because he was in the downwind, they knew he was coming in. So that, you know, they would have known he was out there somewhere. If you can't communicate to the tower, find the shortest route to safe and clear like crazy and get to a ramp location out of the way. Um, then find a way to call the tower or discuss options. Uh, if the pilot had exited on the bottom item, uh, had exited the runway to the right, he would have faced an area of the airfield with which he was unfamiliar but would have not needed to cross an active runway to get there. Okay, lessons learned, and then, you know, we can discuss it after this. Uh, don't rush yourself to unwarranted action. Look for the safest route, not just one with which you are familiar, which was part of the problem, and that, that's, you know, old habits, you know, seem to get to us. Uh, an extra second or two of consideration can keep uncomfortable situations from becoming a tragic one. Uh, get a bigger, brighter flashlight. Uh, remove colored lens, removable co color lens and night ops. Carry a cell phone or portable transceiver. Uh, perceived danger can drive decisions we wouldn't make in hindsight. And of course he puts in there what the opposite of hindsight is, is forethought. Before you fly, think of what can go wrong and then consider the options. Irrespective of what, you know, any discussions we have in here, those are the things that we need to do. Just, you know, we all know that, but sometimes we go out to the airplane and we kind of, you know, I, I don't want to say kick the tires and light the fires because I know nobody really does that, but we sometimes don't think about, you know, oh, I'm just flying the pattern. Well, you know, anything can go wrong there. So always have a way out. Always know what, the, what you're going to do if something can happen, will, or if something happens. Uh, let's see. Hang or flying today can help us make the right call tomorrow. Okay. All right. Any discussion on this? Yeah, I, I, when did they cancel the emergency? I don't know if it was ever an emergency. Well, he's got to be an emergency. He lost all electrical power. He's yeah. got an emergency. Yeah. And when he has an emergency, all the runways are closed uh -huh. until he gets clear of them. Yeah. Well, that's ATC rules. So if okay. ATC didn't see the airplane, he owned that whole airport. Ain't a guy flying and don't know it. But did he talk to ATC? Yeah. Well, he can't because he lost electrical power. I said power. before he lost his power. So well, he was before in he lost power, did he, he didn't have an emergency. No, yeah. what I'm saying is that I agree 
that there's a lot of things you can do about it, but the guy didn't do anything illegal. I'd have violated air traffic control myself. Okay. Because they're not observing the airport. Yeah, but see, I don't. It, oh, but who, I do know, Roger. No, no, no. Twenty years in the business. I, I do know. know. Who would have declared the emergency? ATC. The pilot. How, How could he have done that? But the point I'm getting at is that when he lost electrical power, he was in an emergency status. Okay. When he was in emergency status, when he looked out and saw an airplane landing on a runway, the entire airport is closed, not just one runway. Yeah. All because you don't know what he's doing. And he owns the airport. Okay, well that's... And then when he gets clear, <laughs> yeah. then you get a hold of it and say, what was your problem? Now, if he didn't have an emergency, then he goes bye-bye. But if he has an emergency, it's like, hey, it handled. I'm saying he flew the airplane right, he did everything right, rather than, and I agree, you can do a few things that would preclude in the event this happened. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's what we like to do, but I would hate to think that we chastise this guy. For well, apparently they did. I mean, not, I don't know. Here's, it sound like to me, he was in flight talking to the tower, and he got his clearance to land, and after that he lost his electric power. Yeah. Because he was, well, according to this, he was, uh, oh, even with the threshold. But we threshold. don't know that he, he got clearance. See, down, there's, right? there's a couple of things missing here. We don't know if it was dark or not dark. Well, that's well it was dark. It was dark. dark. No, it was dark. See, it says night. So if yeah. he lands, you can't see him because he has no lights. I have another aspect in regards to landing and then not moving. My viewpoint, I would have stayed there. I would have called 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF. Call... Call March Airfield, KRIV. Tell them that I'm out here on this taxi with no lights and nothing. I need an escort back into the ramp. And what they will do then, they have a direct line or here, just like they do. Or the other number here that we have is 4404, the same number you yeah. do when you file a flight plan. They get on the hotline and call the tower. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that he didn't think about in regards to this. But also, the scenario doesn't give all of the information that should be up there for you to make yeah, a correct yeah. decision. I agree. And a uh, silly question, if it was so dark, if he didn't know not to cross the runway, how would they ever have known? I don't know. I have no yeah. idea. It's a lot more to it. Than see, it. see the thing is, we're not, this is just all do. we got. Yeah. You're seeing what, I, what we got. <laughs> you know? assumptions. Yeah, but I mean, he he said they say right in here, if you see no light signals, then they are still searching for you. So apparently they didn't know where he was at, although you know he never let it happen that way. He just kept going instead of stopping. What they're saying is just stop the airplane and get off the runway. Well, I mean, this, you know, this is what we got, and this is what you're going to read. And, you know, uh, don't, you know, I'm just trying to give you the idea is that think ahead before you fly, okay? That was the whole point behind this. Yes, Jay. I think it's a good discussion. Can I get you thinking about what's going on? Yeah. So the guy didn't yeah. try anything, he landed, and there's some discussion about whether or not he didn't try anything after he landed. Exactly, but, yeah. Uh, so, so that's good. That's, that's good. Yeah. Something to think about, though. Well, that was the whole point. After, the, after you land, yeah. you know, the right thing by getting it on the ground. The majority of the time when this happens, when it fades, because the elevator kicked off line, and usually if you reset it, you're like, back. So that's the food for thought also. Yeah. See, down at the bottom it says, think about it before you fly. That's the whole point behind this whole safety grip. It's just, you know, don't, I mean, I, I don't know how many of you, you know, like today, we had a couple of you guys just go up and just do the pattern, you know. Uh, Rich did and uh, Gene, you know, and how, you know, did you guys think ahead about, you know, what if you lost your engine or something? Now, I mean, I know you, after a while when you fly the same airfield over and over and over again, you kind of have an idea of where you're going to go if you lose an engine. But, you know, but you should think about each time you do fly, you know, get out there and just uh, take thought of, you know, what are you going to do? Especially, you know, if you're in downwind, are you going to try to make it to the runway? If you're on takeoff, are you going to try to get back around over to the other runway? Now, today we took off. Uh, you guys were using runway three two, right? 
Now, there isn't a whole lot out there to go right now because of the construction going on. Yeah, that's the only thing you had. Uh, of course, you probably you could have sat it down in the construction area, but that would have done some damage too. Okay, any questions more? Any uh, confusion? Jerry's sitting back there, you know, half asleep. <laughs> Notes, okay. Okay, add a note from March, as many as you know, we have extensive construction. And uh, um, the bottom line here, um, I don't know if this is accurate right now. This is what, as of today, but I don't know. See, things have been changing on this, but this right, is the... Right now, it goes to, it's close to the 28th of June. So, see, they've let it go from the, tw they've added three days to the 25th to the 28th, whether that 28th to 2 July is going to be in operation, nobody knows yet. So right now, the, the time frame is uh, from presently to the 28th of June. So what's so stopping... they've extended it. What's stopping us is runway, or is taxiway delta being closed. And uh, they've been trying, supposedly, that, run, that uh, taxiway is supposed to have been opened up several times and it hasn't. And this last weekend, it was supposed to be opened up because they were supposed to be finished with that, that part of the construction last Friday. Well, that didn't happen. So, as a consequence, that's, we ended up shutting everything down. And... Uh, we also have somebody back over there that can talk about it too. Well, how the C-17s got affected by that too. Uh, the possibility that Delta will be open a little sooner because they were out pouring concrete. They had, I don't know, numerous concrete trucks today out on Delta, so they're they're covering up the, the ditch. So I'm kind of anticipating that 3-0 and 12 may be open by the end of the week. I mean, that, it, it appears to me. I, I'm not going to make the decision, but there's a lot of pressure going on right now because it's causing a big turmoil, and the contractor can't keep up with the schedule that he was given and he said he was under contract to do. Okay. All right. All right. Summer flying, it's not like what you think. It's just, I'm just covering real quick some uh, topics for summer flying. Uh, now that it's summertime, a lot of the guys are coming out here after work, and uh, the the that's fine. That's that's perfectly good. Especially the students. If we get more students, we already got a couple of new members. Uh, one of which is sitting right there, and uh, and if they need to, they have to work. They can come out and do uh, some flying with their instructor. Uh, however, a lot of people don't realize that just like the Air Force and the airlines, the Aero Club also has crew duty day. And uh, in Air Force Manual 34-232 for Aero Clubs, paragraph 3-17-4 says the maximum Aero Club duty day is 12 hours for single pilot and 16 hours for two qualified pilots. Uh, duty day starts when the pilot reports to the Aero Club for the first flight of the day or to the place of employment where they work of the day, whichever occurs first. So if you've been sitting there working, let's say you, you know, start at 5 o'clock in the morning and you work a 12-hour shift, well, you just about, if you were going up by yourself, that blows it right there. So be careful. Be really attuned to that, okay? Um, the, and the, I know when I used to fly in the 141, you know, we would put in an all-day work, an eight-hour day, but we really had to be careful that we didn't break the, the, the crew duty limit for that day. Um, okay, second paragraph, even though you are in the limits and you know that you can stay within those limits, be aware of how tired you are, okay? Fatigue from working sometimes can really catch up to you, and you might feel real good 
when you go out and doing your pre-flight in the airplane, but if you happen to be doing something, especially if you're doing something where you're going to go any kind of a distance and back again, you don't want to get there and start heading back and all of a sudden, uh, you know, how many of you know what I mean when I say the sleepies hit you? Kapow. You know, and it's like all of a sudden it just hits you. Just be aware of what your limitations are and just what can happen, you know, if you get out there and uh, you don't, uh, you know, you don't want to get to some place and, and make the wrong judgments because that's when the judgment gets impaired too. Um, any questions on this? Any additions? Okay, density altitude, real quick. Okay, it is summertime, density altitude really becomes an effect. Of course, it is down here in Southern California all year round. Um, uh, we should be, uh, you know, as it approaches, we need to be aware that during the summertime, there are some limitations. A lot depends on the kind of airplane you fly and how much fuel you got in and all that kind of stuff, but the biggie is density altitude. Density altitude kills more people every year, and it's amazing how many people completely ignore density altitude. I just cannot believe it. It's amazing. I mean, I, I'll read some safety reports, and, and, and I've talked, I'm not myself, but they've talked to people who have survived crashes, and they, well, I've been doing this for years, but they added just a little bit of extra fuel, added that one more suitcase, or added that one more passenger, or whatever. Just be really aware of density altitude. Um, <coughs> Let's see, cause of, okay, how many know exactly what density altitude is? Any of the students should know that right off the top of their head. I know Robert Youngblood does. He knows everything. Well, almost. So, um, and all of you guys that fly jets, yeah, remember when you're flying a propeller airplane, it, it's worse. Of course, I know you can feel it in a jet too, but not as much. Uh, okay. Whether it be low or high altitudes, hot, high, humid temperatures can change your routine takeoff and landing into an accident is less time than it takes to tell about it. Um, how many have seen the video of that uh, A36 that crashed off the end of the runway? Uh, nobody's ever seen it? I played it for one of the safety meetings once. I guess nobody was there. Okay. Yeah, they have a video of the A36 taking off and it, it and it, it density altitude. They had four people in the thing and he crashed off the end of the runway and it killed two of the people. And somebody had a video of the thing. Okay, three important factors affect the air density. Altitude, the higher the altitude, the less dense the air. Temperature, the warmer the air, less dense is the air. Humidity, humidity is not generally considered a factor as much. Um, it can be a factor, but for the most part, you use altitude and temperature for the most part, so you don't usually uh, get into that too much. Um, it can retain water vapors, and um, at 96 degrees Fahrenheit, water vapor is eight times greater than 42 degrees Fahrenheit. So high density altitude and high humidity do not often go hand in hand. So it doesn't necessarily mean just because it's uh, high, you know, your density altitude is high doesn't mean that your humidity is. Uh, as the guy I was listening to talk today about, about this was that he was from Florida. In Florida they have huge amounts of humidity. But out here in California, which he comes out here and flies there once in a while, he said, you know, it's completely different, but it still doesn't change the fact that the airplane still thinks it's higher than where it's supposed to be, um, or what the airplane actually is. Um, okay, um, so for the most part, um, the basic bottom line explanation is what the airplane feels if the altitude is higher to the airplane than what the airplane really is. 
and uh, the scientific explanation is it's pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperature. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to calculate density altitude. Uh, so there's no real excuse to be able to just walk out there and not do it. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has the E6B computer, you know, the round dial computer. I don't know, does anybody here have any? <laughs> Jerry Roll, yeah. I still got mine. <laughs> we also have one in the training room in the back too. But they also make calculators and things like that that does that too. There is also a formula, and if you want to see it, I got it right here, and you can write it down. It's also not too hard to figure that out through that too. Hey, Roger. Yeah. So that's the easiest way right there. Now, Big Bear has a big display that tells you what this is. In case you haven't done it. Oh yeah. If you have a temp gauge and altimeter, you can set to on I two. Right. And you got your PA. And then exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. That, and, and just like Jay said, this right here is the easiest, right here. Um, your POH is, is generally, everything in it is set to standard temperature. And so you want to, and then of course you're going to, going to change from that. Um, don't do it while you're rolling down the runway. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I say that because... Uh, I was in an airplane where the pilot, oh, yeah, hey, Roger, do the density altitude. Oh, okay, while we're going down the runway. Um, yeah, so I won't tell you who the pilot was. Uh, okay, any questions here? Is there anybody who's taking notes? I know you are. Yeah, there is. I've got a question here. Yeah. Roger, I was going to say, a Coke chart is a very good way to get a very visual I indication of what yeah. effect yeah. it has. It, it, the, the data charts in the aircraft POH mask the problem. They don't make it apparent. Mm. And the problem with the data charts in the POH is it's done with a test pilot. Oh, yeah. With a brand new airplane yeah. until they get it to the numbers they want. Yeah. So they're overly optimistic with the numbers. Well, you're just not going to get the same performance that you're going to see in the, in the charts. Yeah. So if you use a Coke chart, you're going to very graphically see, you know, all you got to do is put the temperature on one side and the density altitude on the other side, and right in the middle you're going to read what your percentage of increase is, the going, increase to be. is going to be. Yeah. And, uh, that's available yeah. online. It's available on my website. I've got an article on density altitude. If you go to www.wild-blue-yonder.com and look for the density altitude article, there's a Coke chart right on there and tells you exactly how to use it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, because I, I wish we had had, if I'd known that, I would have uh, tried to get one and put one up there. You know, so. But, uh, yeah, see Rich. Have him uh, give you that site again, because I, I know I didn't get it all. <laughs> but, uh, okay, any questions? Okay, rules of thumb. This is just rules of thumb. All this is is just something that was thrown out to just kind of give you an idea. And it isn't just only density altitude. Uh, Takeoff distance, uh, fixed pitch, add 12% for every 1,000 feet, up to 8,000 feet. Um, by the way, how, in any of the charts that are in the books, how high is their, what's the highest most of them are? You know, the little charts in there, how high do they go? They only go up to a certain altitude. I don't remember right off the top of my head, but I, I was hoping somebody would, like some of you instructors. <laughs> I know that, I think it's about, about it's either 7,500 or 8,000. That's why they talk about here, you know, from 1,000 feet to 8,000 feet elevation. Because I know that, that there's a certain point where it doesn't do you any good. I know in the C-141, when we used to do read from the charts, there was some in there that they, they weren't good over a certain uh, altitude. 
And I know the airlines also. The airlines, I, I know some of the guys, uh, John Reed was talking about that one time, uh, is that you, they, even though they can calculate it out, it's only good up to a certain point or a certain temperature. If the temperature goes up above a certain, and I don't remember what that temperature is. 117 is, is the most, most somewhere around 117. Yeah. Yeah, 117. Yeah. So, you know, when you start getting extremes, maybe they, you may need, maybe you don't want to fly. You know, Air Force and airlines have to, but, uh, you know, in these airplanes, you don't have to. Of course, I know you may be wanting to get back to your job, but uh, sometimes, you know, maybe you don't want to come back to your job either, so. <laughs> okay. Um, Take off distance with a constant speed prop, add 10% for every 1,000 feet to 8,000 feet. Uh, okay, runway surfaces. Um, I know that it can affect you. If you're on grass and things like that, you add 7%. For us, we don't really need to worry about that because we aren't even supposed to be landing on grass or anything like that. Uh, soft field, add 23 to 75%. And snow and mud. Now that Roger, that could sure. happen. Would yeah. You say that again. That air club airplanes are not allowed to land on grass fields. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Grass or I didn't know that. dirt. Yes. In the yeah. Yeah. Aero clubs plane. They've never, ever, ever allowed you to do that. Even when I was in the aero club way back in uh, we back in those days. Um, never have. Um, but this possibility you could end up in snow and mud, I suppose. I mean, you know, here in California maybe, but actually you could end up in some place where you, on the runway you could have snow. And usually if you have snow, don't bother doing it anyhow. But it will add 20% to 50% to your runway takeoff if you do. Uh, maximum depth for takeoff in water and slush and snow. Like if it's rain. Sometimes here we do get some pretty heavy rains here. And I, Bob and I have stood there in front of the aero club and watched these huge storms coming across. And I mean, it rained so hard that the whole ramp was like about that thick of water. And uh, so whenever that happens, if you happen to be out there, just don't take off. But they don't want you to, you shouldn't take off with a half inch or more. And, uh, and of course, the chances of us getting into the snow, uh, really, you probably it's nil, but if you do, it's uh, wet snow, you don't want it to be more than one inch, and dry snow, you don't want it to be more than four inches. And of course, there's many, many, many other variables, and I don't know if you guys are writing notes, there's a, a site that you can go to, which uh, gives a lot of, uh, um, you know, other variables that can take place in affecting your flying of the airplane. The big thing I wanted to get to is density altitude tonight. Self-explanatory. Any questions? Okay. Um, I'm trying to be asking a question right there. Okay. Yes. Well, that I know Fred has done this before. That's a good time to ask. Questions. With his students too. And actually, Fred, you should tell that story sometime. That one about the one guy just went like that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, did um, everybody sign the sign-in sheet? Okay. Those who haven't, make sure you find it. Where is it? Hold it up. Okay, Bob's got it. Okay, make sure you come up and sign that. Uh, Let's see, I want to make sure I don't forget, because last time, every time I end the meeting, I end it too quick, and I remember stuff. And besides, it's before 8 o'clock. Long before 8 o'clock, I could talk another 10 minutes. <laughs> um, one other thing. Most of you in here are doing okay, I think, but there are, we had nine people's uh, credit cards reject this uh, off the dues this uh, month. Uh, out of the nine, four people uh, paid already. Uh, there's still five or no. Yeah, there's no. There's one guy's paying another tomorrow. And then, okay, so there's about four people still yet that uh, I haven't been able to get a hold of and talk to. So uh, if your credit card gets compromised or your credit card gets lost or you get a new credit card, please 
tell me. You know, try to remember. I know it's I've, I've done it too. I've done the same thing, but try to remember to let me know and give me the new credit card number. And one other thing, your personnel files. Okay, um, a lot of you are really good at bringing in your updated uh, physicals and signing your uh, covenant not to sue, but please try to remember to do that. Remember every year you have to take, for those that are qualified pilots, have to take the standards test <coughs> and the SOP local procedures test every single year and you got to go up with one of the instructors to get a, a annual it's not really a check ride, but it's an annual ride with an instructor that he just checks you out to make sure you haven't picked up any bad habits. If it happens to coincide with a, with a BFR, a biannual flight review, you can have them both. But remember, when you do the BFR, then you've got to be doing the whole scenario, the whole thing. I think it's an hour, Fred, is it? It's an hour ground training and an hour in the airplane. Nothing less than that. Not Fred. if you do it through wings. Oh, yes. <laughs> wings. How many know about wings here? Okay, a lot of you do. Yeah. If you do wings, that would be a way to do it. The aero clubs check right for for their annual is nothing. I mean, all it is is just to make sure that you haven't picked up any bad habits. That's all it is. The instructor goes up there and sees if you're doing everything the way you're supposed to be doing. But you can, like I said, if you haven't done it through wings, then you can do it from the aeroplane. Okay. Um, can I give an example for extensive altitude? Well, if you want to do that, yeah. Um, we'll do a contest real quick. Okay, if I'm not, well, what I'm going to do is say that those who want need to leave, you can leave. But uh, uh, Bob wants to do something, uh, show a quick uh, thing on density altitude here. So, I have a suggestion to uh, one of the other club members and I were out flying, and I think it may be a good idea for people to go out and fly, get a flying partner, and uh, pick up some bad habits and good habits. I wouldn't do that. I do it better than he does or whatever. And it's uh, easy on the pocketbook, too. Just a suggestion. Good work, sir. Yeah. I know the. I'm going to do it all the time back Oh, yeah. I, I, I almost <laughs> always try to fly with somebody else. I, I, don't, I don't like flying by myself. I guess because I flew in the 141 where you had to prove uh, at least five. And I got used to that, so <laughs> I can't get five into the six six November, but at least I can try. <laughs> Bob, last month we talked about uh, flyways for breakfast and uh, lunches. Play Bob is closed. Uh, they have a new owner came out of Rialto. Uh, he's anticipating open up uh, opening Play Bob on July the first. Um, I was hoping that we could do something on the 22nd, which is coming Saturday, or the following Saturday for a flyaway, but that's kind of iffy right now until we understand where the airport's going to be for uh, runway use for the weekends. But um, they come up with an email if people are interested uh, for a flyaway. Uh, Camarillo, I was up there last weekend for ground school, and you're going to need an estimate approach and an estimate departure to get in and out for a while. So I'll guarantee you on that. So we could do uh, El Monte, Fullerton, and Apple Valley. The 182 engine is another two weeks away, maybe. <laughs> That's okay, because you're always calling to find out about the 182. So they've had it for three months. I just sent a, a, nasty, you know, a nasty gram about the, the company to Eric Treland. And I said, you know, for a few thousand dollars more, if you can get the money, it may be better to go to someone who can give you better service than to wait three months for an engine and they say, well, we're still working on it. I mean, that's totally unacceptable for everybody here. So people have lost their uh, requirements with that airplane being down. The same thing is taking place with 5.7 for the engine. And I'm still working on the wing. I'm still waiting for the uh, modification to the wing on 5.55 because they came up with a 6000 to $5,000 uh, dollar estimate to fix the wing on 5.5 for the F-SPAR. 
However, I said, we don't have the expertise to get the wing off. What is the cost if I take and ferry the aircraft to your facility in Chino? And that's been a week now, and he's, I just made a phone call this morning and said, I've got to have it. We've got to get this thing going. So we're still trying, and the money for 57ZZ, uh, uh, Colonel Mahaney said, well, if prices are going up October 1st, why don't we just take and approve it? And the consul approved it, but it's being held up at Robbins. Uh, people back there holding it up. I don't know why uh, the money comes out of the local fund here to get that engine, not back there. But uh, I haven't given up yet. I haven't given up yet. So those are just some areas in that. Scott? Oh, I was just going to say, you mentioned the flyway to Apple Valley. I was told recently that the restaurant in Apple Valley is closed again. Again. Closed again? Yeah, they didn't make it. That's what I was told on my squadron. Well, pretty well close probably pretty close. No, we're in a business. Yeah, Richard. July 20th is the uh, summer barbecue at Catalina, if you want to think about doing that. Yeah. Well, not everybody's qualified. I understand. That's, yeah, that's I'm just saying it's a possibility yeah. for those well, that are. Yeah. Uh, it's a great barbecue, and it's a, it's a fun party. Well, that would be the, the way to get, get people qualified. qualified. Yeah. yeah. You missed a good barbecue in Redlands uh, last Saturday from the Masonic Lodge, 700 pounds of uh, beef and pork. You can barbecue down at George's house. Yeah, I know. I don't have any more pork. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's, I want to cover just a couple things here. We'll cut some answers real quick, like on uh, density altitude. What's the altitude at uh, Big Bear Lake? Is what? 67, what? 6752. Okay. <laughs> okay. The temperature is 74 degrees. Temperature is 74 degrees. Altimeter is 2988. And we'll use 28% uh, uh, of uh, dew point spread. What is the elevation, what is the density altitude roughly ballpark figure? What's the temp? What's the temp? 74 degrees. Around 9,000. Well, it's, it's 28 degrees for the uh, dew, uh, dew point. If you're looking at 82 degrees, you're going to be around 10.5. 10.5. Aircraft engines don't work very well, especially when you got 140 horsepower, 160 horsepower. <laughs> Even the Bonanza doesn't work real well. I refuse to fly up there when it starts getting above 75. And I just wait until the winter months come and I go back up. That's just me. Uh, especially when I have to use an extra 10% on the runway with tip tanks. Uh, if I have a 140 horsepower engine with the same requirements that I just, or the same parameters that I just gave out on you, any, any ideas of what the uh, uh, horsepower rating would be? And we're talking about a new engine. 140 horsepower at sea level, what's it going to be at the density altitude at Big Bear we just talked about? It runs about 9,300 feet is where the density altitude for those temperature ranges. You know, if the, if the altimeter is off just a little bit, it's going to vary. Any ideas? How much horsepower am I going to produce with, with the parameters I just gave you out of a Cherokee, we'll see, or even out of our, our Cessnas, which are produced about 140 horsepower? How about 105? That's why they always end up in the lake. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't work, guys. So, like was said earlier, they have a big neon sign on runway. Is it 24 or 26? Correct me if I'm wrong. 26. And it says your density altitude is such and such. And it's a reminder because if you go into operations, they actually have a chart in there, and you're welcome to pick one of those up and take it with you, and you can calculate your density altitude off the, off the chart. And it holds pretty, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. The other thing you can do is just get on Google. Uh, I can't pull it up. Roger's right, you've got to have the uh, website available to you. There's an app for that. Yeah, there is an app. Anyway, uh, John's got the answer there. But you can yeah. just, go, just Google density altitude, and you look at the English metric system. It's about the second one down on the drop line. Open it up. It was developed for engineering in regards to automotive racing. And for there, you can figure your horsepower rating on an altitude. And don't forget, here at March, when we start getting up to 100 degrees, you know, uh, 3,800 feet, 4,000 feet, for an, out, an elevation of 1,547 at the uh, at the Aero Club, very common on a daily on a daily basis. 
So you're going to eat up runway to get to your flying speed. Just remember that. Thank you. Okay, no other questions. Next safety means 16 July. Brandon is school.